for one simple reason. And that is the main difference between Pan-Africanism and the European uh, movement or dynamics. Issues that were appearing in the 1940s had to do with decolonization, with the right to independence, with protest against colonialism, racial segregation in South Africa and Portuguese ter territories and so on, these issues are essentially political issues. Whereas for the European, because sometimes the question is asked, is there a link or a comparison between the path followed by Europe and the path followed by Africa for its integration? And the, the answer is no. Because we had to deal first with political matters in the form of all that I've just uh, described. Whereas the Europeans could not talk about politics, they only could talk about economics. Because between Germany and France, they were not exactly friends in 1945. So that kind of pan Africanism, political pan Africanism, went on until the early 1980s. And the third type of Pan-Africanism could be labeled economic Pan-Africanism. And that was experimented by the putting together of the legal, the Lagos Plan of Action, 1980, year 2000. And here for once, the Africans were able to anticipate, because it was from 1979, that they prepared the Lagos Plan of Action and were able, therefore, to present a 20-year plan going from 1990 to 2000. In fact, major African institutions were at the beginning of this uh, project. You have the African Development Bank. You also had the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, ECA, but later on, an institution such as the Pan-African Institute for Development in terms of training Pan-African minds. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in view of what has just been said, how can, can one answer the following two troubling questions? Even though Pan-Africanism is now 100 and 16 years old, more than a century old, how can it be understood that pan-Europeanism, created only 50 years ago, has become a reality on that continent? In the form of the European Economic Union, the EEC first, and the European Union later, how is it possible to understand that it has become a reality, whereas the Pan-Africanist approach is still being perceived as a project, including in the minds of many Africans. Because the problem that we face year in and year out is to bring the Africans themselves to adhere to the fact that we are a continent and we shall move, think, act as a continent. It is a very difficult proposition. Many Africans, including Africans, African intellectuals, tend to challenge that and bring in all kinds of, I would say, not very convincing arguments. Furthermore, the second question, therefore, how can one explain that armed countries can easily spill over neighboring countries and become transnational. As opposed to African economic growth, which experiences some difficulties to spread from one country to the next and become transnational. In other words, the negative aspect tends to disseminate quickly all over the continent as opposed to the positive one. Now, conflict as a challenge to peace, development, and Pan-Africanism. 
The African continent is very often portrayed as being in crisis today, considering the extent of conflicts still going on in that region. I'm saying portrayed because one can challenge the reality on the, fact, on, on the ground. In 1996, 20 years ago, there were 17 countries in Africa. Wars, basically. Today we have around seven major, not wars, but countries. And yet, when you listen to the international press, what they focus on, it was that this is what doesn't go okay in Africa. Rarely do they say something positive about Africa. Africa is famine, is an earthquake, it's war, it's coup d'etat, and so on and so forth. And I ask the question, is there a place on earth where 365 days a year you only have drama? It's not possible. So it means that there is a selection of news to be broadcasted on Africa. And we must not fall into that trap. Because then it will go into our subconscious mind to think that Africa means disaster, gloom, and doom. And once you accept that, you prepare to accept aid, help, and so-called partnership development. Because it becomes natural in a land where everything has failed, supposedly. So I think we must not fall into that trap, because indeed, it is a trap. Not everything is okay in Africa. It's true. Africa is not more of a paradise than anywhere else. But Africa is not the worst place to be. Otherwise, how, how can you explain that cooperation is going strength, stronger and stronger with Japan? with Turkey, African-Turkish uh, uh, Forum, uh, Japan-African Forum, uh, European Union Africa Forum, US Africa Forum, China Africa Forum, and so on and so forth, which is in total contradiction with the gloomy portrayal which is trying to be forced on us. Now, another aspect is that today, in 2016, Of course, this good news is mitigated by the fact that the prosperity which all Africans are longing for is not there yet. Yet, it's true. Violent conflicts are still to be identified in Africa. The problem which we are facing today, and one of the paradoxes of Africa, is that although the number of conflicts has reduced drastically, the intensity of those conflicts and the impact on the population has grown much more, much deeper. Why? Because 30 years ago, 80% of the victims of conflicts were military personnel, and 20% were civilian. Today, that proportion is reversed. 80% of the casualties are civilian. And only 20%, if I can say so, are military personnel. Worse still, within those civilian brackets, the majority of the casualties are women and children. And therefore, the impact on the social dynamics of Africa. The impact on the development of Africa is much wider and much deeper, even though the number of countries, as I said before, has been reduced, but the impact is much greater today. So that's why we must be very careful when we portray conflict and conflict, as I could say, conflictuality in Africa, because the modalities are changing, and we must be aware that. Violent conflicts, therefore, are on the rise. Violent conflicts, yes. 
And as we all know, peace is positively correlated to development. Without it, you cannot talk about development, except in your dreams, but not in reality. And that is why many Cameroonians have understood that. It is better to be at peace, even if poor, than at war, plus being poor. In fact, the relationship between peace and Pan-Africanism can be isolated in one aspect. The drawing of frontiers has been a major problem in terms of peacekeeping and maintenance in Africa. Figures show, and this is from a book written by a Nigerian scholar, Professor Asiwaju, who wrote a book called Partition Africans in the early 1960s, a fundamental book, which studies the impact and the uh, importance of the problem of frontiers. If you have time to read it during your holidays, I would advise that you should read it. So what he says in that book is that 60% of conflicts between 1960 and 1970 in Africa were directly related to dispute pertaining to conflict concerning border drawings and contestations. 60%. Which means that they were, they were fighting African countries about things they did not themselves design because none of them were around the table in Berlin between uh, during the Berlin conference that took place between the 15th of November 1884 and the 23rd of February 1885. There was no Cameroonian there, there was no African there, but the frontiers were drawn and therefore became official. And we were fighting over those problems later on. So you see there's a link between the notion of Pan-Africanism that denies that these frontiers are legitimate and should be a, a reason for fighting each other. But instead, Pan-Africanism says that we must use frontiers as bridges and cross them and if possible even ignore them and redraw our own logical frontiers. So that's one aspect. When you, when, you, when you match Pan-Africanism with the notion of peace and security. The second is insurgencies. And the kind of insurgencies which we are facing today have nothing to do with Africa. Nothing whatsoever. I'll give you a, just a few examples. Al-Qaeda was not born in Africa. It has nothing to do with Africa. Islamic Maghreb, Achim, same thing. And the Boko Haram, terrorists, because that's what they are. They are not jihadists, as we hear them, as we hear it said over and over on international news media, and they are not Muslim. The reason why I'm saying they are not Muslim is 80% of the of the victims. Muslims. And they break every single rule of the Quran. Every single rule of the Quran. They choose the holiest month of the Quran, which is the Ramadan, to perpetrate their worst atrocities. Yes. And last time when they went to protocol, they waited until five o'clock, which is a time of prayer. When they went and hiding around the, the mosques, when they knew that the faithful, the real faithful Muslims, had now gathered into the mosque, they surged into the mosque and started slaughtering the imams first. The imams and then the rest of the Muslim community. Ladies and gentlemen, if you call these people Muslims, 
I don't know what that term means. So we must reject that as Cameroonians. We must not use that term. What they are is that they are terrorists. And the definition of terrorism in international relations and in political science is the use of violence in order to attain political aims. And this is precisely who they are, what they are doing, and they want to redraw the map of Africa according to a mythical uh, conception which is only in the heads. So, when I say all this, I want to, to, to really underline the fact that African Islam is different from the Middle Eastern Islam. Why? African Islam is communal. It is communal, it is tolerant. Nowhere in Africa you have people wearing belts of dynamics, of, of, uh, of explosives, going to blow each other up. It is not in our tradition. Why? Because when you keep, kill yourself in a suicide, you will not bear it with the rest of the community. I hope you know that. It is a curse which you bring not only on yourself, but also on your entire community, which is ashamed of you, as it should be. And that is really the essence of our culture as Africans. We must not accept importation of strange and bizarre conceptions of Islam or whatever, which have nothing to do with Africa and nothing to do certainly with Cameroon. The price of peace is at that level to understand who we are and to know that there's no paradise on earth. Those who think that they will leave and go to greener pastures, I think that it is an illusion. You must build your green pastures here in your country. Let's go back to Pan Africanism. All this is related because the way to settle these things is as a community at the continental level. The approach which consists now in terms of economic analysis, the approach which consists in listening, Africa is 60% of the world. Gold mines is true, diamond, copper, and so on and so forth. But that analysis is quite misleading because you don't eat diamond, you don't eat copper, you don't eat uh, gold, but you drink coffee, but Africans don't drink coffee. <laughs> they produce coffee, but they don't drink it. Isn't it true? So, the problem that we have today is to reassess and, re and reformulate all this approach. In fact, the cause of conflicts today is that the real reason for those conflicts has to do with the impact of the consi consistently growing African population. The other reason for conflict, of course, is the very, very low level of intra-African trade and exchanges. We cannot, under no circumstance, we cannot pretend that Africa will become an emerging continent if we still keep an exchange at between 10 and 12 percent only. It's too slow, it's too small, and it's too insignificant because it would be a torturous journey to get there. That is why it's difficult to talk seriously about integration of Africa if all those dimensions, transportation, um, education, and so on, are not taken care of. It's very important. Now, horizontal integration is precisely the, the, 
the idea that we must multiply road networks that are linked to the needs of the Africans. Because the road networks which we have inherited are linked to the need of shipping goods from the hinterland to the coast. They have nothing to do with human relations and human interaction. So we must do that. The Nepal has started, and I'm not, I'm not saying that nothing has been done, Nepal has started to do that, but we must continue. Okay? So, I will have to stop my, uh, my uh, inaugural lecture, because otherwise I won't want to transform this, this into an amphitheater. I uh, understand that the most important part, probably, is that you are waiting for your diplomas, and I think it's very important. I just want to, to conclude by saying that Pan-Africanism is no longer a philosophical concept or a philosophical uh, thought. It is a necessity for the survival of Africa. But Pan-Africanism is a fight, is a struggle. Because we must not forget that there are many more people who do not want Pan-Africanism to become a reality. And if we ignore that fact, we will be in the wrong side of the analysis. There are those for whom Pan-Africanism is a very deadly challenge and a very dangerous challenge. Because it means an Africa which is in a position to solve its own problems and to design its own uh, paths to get to the solutions which are adequate. So we must, without saying that we should put people against each other, civilizations against, against each other, I'm not for that. I'm for the taking into consideration of the fact that we have the right to develop according to our culture, according to our need, and according to the means which our God gave us. We don't have to apologize to anybody, and we don't have to seek permission from anybody. Thank you very much. Indeed.